we believe that this message will be a blessing to you so I want you to stay glued and watch to the end and share to bless others this is Christocentric we have a lot of Apostle Eric Nyamiche's message on our platform kindly check them out thank you for watching stay blessed well, let me start by saying a big thank you to all of you you celebrated my birthday with me and i want to say thank you to every one of you may the lord continue to bless you but my request is one and very simple it is still the ancient one Please continue to pray for me. Continue to pray for me. Yeah, when it was my birthday, the number of prayers I received was, hey, you do a praying for me every day like that. But it's a reflection of your heart and love for us. And I'm grateful. God bless everyone of you. you. So the church called to worship. The church called to worship. We saw that God called Israel out of Egypt to worship him in the wilderness. That is why we decided to look at worship from that perspective. Now, worship is a vital religious right that is increasingly losing its true meaning. And value in the Christian church today. As, as a result of the many misconceptions of worship, the dynamic glory of God in the church and in the life of believers is lacking. So we decided to discuss worship and invite you to rethink, relearn, and re enter the school of worship. So today we will continue with. The church called to worship, but our subheading for today is the church in the wilderness. The church in the wilderness. The church, the assembly of God's people has been many years before our generation. The church has been the assembly of God's people. The congregation of God's people, what we call the church, has been many years before our generation. Now, in Stephen's response to the high priest question, are these charges true? Brother Stephen, now, he recounted the story of Israel beginning from Abraham. And in speaking of Moses, the servant of God, he revealed that Moses was with the church in the wilderness. Church, yes, the church in the wilderness. As chapter 7. Let's take it from verse 37 through 38. As 7 from 37 to 38. This is that Moses which said unto the children of Israel, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. 
Na uyi ni Mose a o ka kire Israel ma no se odifo a o tese me ene onyankopon be ma no so menuanu mu amamo. Him shall ye hear. I'm now using the King James. Ono ena mu betie no. Now verse 38. Ya san wa twene se. This is he that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel which spoke to him in in the Mount Sinai and with our fathers who received the living oracles to give unto us. So the King James is saying that Moses was with the church in the wilderness. Now other versions will translate it as assembly or congregation. Now there were people called out of Egypt. Simon to Sinai. To meet the Lord. And call to go with him to the promised land. I said that these were people who were called out of Egypt. They were sent to Sana by God himself. And called to go with him, the Lord Almighty, to the promised land. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1 and 4, to four. The apostle Paul interprets Israel's crossing of the Red Sea as analogous to being baptized in Christ. It's Marvel Paul or Israel for our friend one fast or the tutu say what born was so ever Christum. First Corinthians ten. Verse one to four. Mommy and Ken and you to form my and you 1 Corinthians 10, verse 1 to 4. For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud, and that they were all and that they all passed through the sea. And you are not in person with this year, Mose, younger Janumina, Shemunukum, no assay, now one in our far eponum. They all passed through the sea. One in our far eponum. And then Paul is saying that passing through the sea, verse 2 says that they were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink for they drank from the spiritual rock which is Christ. So as they cross the Red Sea, Paul is saying that they were baptized just as we are also baptized in water. And the wonderful thing is that Christ the rock was ever present with them just as he is present with us in our generation. They were an assembly of God. The church of God. They were a congregation of God. They were a people who left Egypt to congregate at the feet of Christ or at the feet of God and God with them, march on to the promised land. So having been delivered from Egypt, they found themselves in the wilderness. What were they doing in the wilderness? For what purpose were they in the wilderness? Now this is what we want to look at tonight. Exodus chapter 5, 1 to 3. Exodus 5, 1 to 3. Afterwards, Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. 
let my people go, so that they may hold a festival to me in the wilderness. So Moses is telling Pharaoh that they are going to hold a festival in the wilderness. Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord? Uh, that was a very good question. That I should obey him and let Israel go. Who is the Lord? Who is the, uh, the Lord who is presiding over slaves? Now, Pharaoh. That I should allow you to go. Who is that kind of Lord? Lord over slaves. Now, Pharaoh say, no, say, why any of you are Ah, mean to you, no. And I say, why is me, me, see, subio. Now, Pharaoh say, no, say, why any of you are there? Me, ne. Na mama Israel akro. I do not know the Lord, and I will not let you go. Minime uradeno na Israel so mere mawongo. Then they said the two of them. Now they chained their their mouth somehow. Then they said the God of the Hebrews has met with us. Now let us take a three day journey into the wilderness. To offer sacrifices to the Lord our God, or He may strike us with plague or with the sword. A few words, you know, now we can only say Hebrew phone yang kupon abisiyeng. Enti ma yengko Israel no so nansa kwang na yengko bo euradi yengko kupon afodi na wamfa uwiyadi anankante ametwayenga. In fact, now Moses is trying to use God's words as he heard it. The first one was not directly from God. But the second time, he is using God's words. The very words God said to him to speak to Pharaoh. This time, he used the same words. So what did God really tell Moses to tell Pharaoh? You see that in chapter 3 and chapter 4 of Exodus. So let's go to chapter 3, verse 18. Chapter 3, 18. The elders of Israel will listen to you. Then you and the elders are to go to the king of Egypt and say to him, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us. Let us take a three-day journey into the wilderness to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God. So this is what God told Moses. Three days Nansa went to, to offer sacrifices in the wilderness. Now, chapter 4, 21 to 23. The Lord said to Moses, When you return to Egypt, see that you perform before Pharaoh all the wonders I have given you, the power to have given you the power to do. But I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. The Radi Catcher Moses said, So what son called Mizrim, I share, not yet, and one idea, my dear Master Wono, the Asha on Sanunina, Faru, and him, now media, me prim, now coma, now or a man uncle. So when Pharaoh was saying, I will not let you go, it was God's own doing. And the brave Pharaoh Eka said, Me, my Israel for uncle, no, 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 this is what the Lord says. Israel is my firstborn son. And I told you, let my son go so he may worship me. But you refuse to let him go. So I will kill your firstborn. Now, I will say, I will say, now say one penny and man one quack. Share. Media. Make him walk back in. 
Now listen, this is just the beginning. But he is telling him the end from the beginning. This is just before the plague started. But God's intent was to kill the firstborn. So until he gets to killing the firstborns, Israel was not going to go. Many a times we tend to miss God's purpose and plan for our lives. If he is dealing with your enemies, you allow him to deal with the enemies. Don't rush. So we went somewhere. We went somewhere and then. There was this discussion. Then there was this politician. He said that when you hit your enemy and you see that he has bowed down his head like that, don't leave him. Finish him. Say, don't give him space to recover. See, God started and he actually wanted to finish Egypt to the extent that the whole world will know that he is the Lord. And so he, he spoke about the end from the beginning. So the fact that Pharaoh should allow Israel to go was repeated by Moses any time that he met Pharaoh. But if we have to examine Moses' request, the first time he says that let my people go so they may hold a festival to me in the wilderness. Now the second time, he said, let us take a three-day journey in the wilderness to offer sacrifices to our, our God. So, Moses, instead of using the word worship, as in chapter 4, decided to use two words, festival, but repeated the, that same word, worship, as sacrifice in chapter 3. <laughs> Now, when we say festival, it is a celebration. Celebration. When we say sacrifice, it denotes service to a deity or someone in any form. It could therefore be said. That all the acts of Israel in the wilderness could be their expression of their celebration and their acts of sacrifice to their God. At least that was what Pharaoh would think because. That was what he was told. So when they came out of Egypt and they were on the wilderness, all that they were doing, it could be an expression of their celebration or an expression of their sacrifice to their God. I want you to hold that in your spirit. There are two Hebrew words for worship. The first one is Saha. 
The second one is Avoda. Now, these two words are usually used to, ref, uh, to interpret its translated worship. Now, Saha literally means to bow down. It carries a connotation of someone prostrating himself or herself or paying homage or being humble to be, to be seeking someone for some help. This, in fact, is the main word for worship. But the second Hebrew word for worship is avoda. Which means to serve. Or to work. To serve or to work as a slave without remuneration. So avoda is sacrificial service. It connotes service to the world or to humanity or to God. So when you have to put the two together in respect to worship, so worship involves not only bowing down as in praising God with our lips or instruments, adoring and celebrating him, but also serving or doing some form of work for the Lord. Moses says we are going to celebrate our God. We are going to sacrifice to our God. And we have said that the two words, Hebrew words that interpret worship is sacrifice. Saha and Avoda. So when we talk about worship, we are not just saying, referring to people bowing down as to in praises or adoration. We are also talking about people serving God. Let me illustrate this in the Old Testament. Are we together? Exodus chapter 20 from 4, four and 5. Exodus 24 and 5. I'm reading from the NIV first, and then I'll take the verse 5 from the King James later. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. No. So just pay attention to this. One. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. We are saying that two ways translates worship. The first one is shaha, which is bowing down. And then the second one is Avoda. But when you look at the NIV, it's saying that you shall not bow down to them or shahad them or avoda them. So let's try and then solve this. Why is the word worship repeated? Now, let's go to the King James verse 5. 
Thou shalt not bow down, so thou shalt not shaha thyself to them, nor serve avoda them. So when you put these two together, you can say that thou shalt not worship them. Thou shall not worship them. Men, sorry, won't cry. So here we see worship as bowing down or serving. Let's go to Daniel chapter 3. Daniel chapter 3. Verse 12. The NIV. Let me, let's, let me take the last line for the sake of time. They neither save your gods. Nor worship the image of God you have set up. They never serve, they never avoda your gods. Nor then this word worship here is shaha, bow down to the image of God that you have set up. Now, so you see that the word worship, anytime that the avoda is said, is said to be saved, they, are, they confidently bring the word worship there. To just to mean to bow down. So it is the main word for worship, but it is worship does not, in, that is not all that the worship is. Worship also means to serve. And to be my walk on sorry, and was him, who said, and sing for me, any way do my own or soon and nay, sir, walk to a woman. Now, you know where you are, and what you say, a chill or sorry, and we are. Verse 14. And you would do me, no. And the book had said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship? So that one should be all what? Bow down to the image of God I have set up. And the book of Neza Bisa one says, Sadrach, Mesak, Ne Abednego, Mobwapa, and a monsum in Yame. Not monsori sika honia, made the messy honor. Verse 18. Yeah, you would do what you Verse 18, same chapter. Those of us who can read, let's go. Mama Yen Kaimumwe. But even if he does not, we want you to know, Your Majesty, that we will not, we will not what save your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Do what you know. Okay, I'll say. Now say, Amasa Mpua on here. We no say. Yere in sum we nyami. Now yere in sorry si kahu niya. We di esi hono. So when we we, we see the word, we will, we, when we see the expression, we will not serve your gods. Or worship here means bow down to and the yeah, image of God you have set up. And here in sum we nyami, na here in sorry sika ho ni na che se, o sorry ya wa hana che se, yen koto sa sika ho ni. Now, the main Hebrew word for worship, I've said it is shaha, to bow down. And the Hebrew for it is translated proskineo in Greek. This is the word for worship in the New Testament. But it is rarely used in the New Testament. It is common in the Gospels where people have to bow to Jesus. And in Revelations when the angels and the four living creatures bow to God. But it is really, it, it is almost absent in the epistles. The epistles also reveal the practical life of the New Testament saint. And you don't see this word 
so much use. And to share a dan a and also Christopher, and in the writings of Paul, you see it in first Corinthians 14. 24, 25. So let's go to 1 Corinthians 14, 24, 25. But if an unbeliever or an inquirer comes in while everyone is prophesying, they are convicted of sin and are brought under judgment by all. Na se won yina shen kum na ubiya on yin ye ana un yin bribia ebemu na won yina fine nim na won yina bunu atea. Verse twenty five. Yimu As the secrets of their hearts are laid bare, so they will fall down this one. And what worship God. Exclaiming, God is really among you. So here the word proskinero is used, bow down and worship God. And yet you know what I'm saying? Now, I'm going to say, 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 but that is it. It doesn't occur in the letters of Peter. It doesn't occur in the letters of James. It doesn't occur in the letters of John. This is so because of the way Jesus practiced and taught worship during his earthly ministry. His main statement that touched worship and caused that word proskinero to be almost non-existent in the New Testament is found in John chapter 4. Now, with his encounter or interaction with the woman of, from Samaria. So let's go visit Jesus and the woman. Let's listen to their stories. Mummy Enko Enko Sra Yesu any Samaria ni bano yenti wangsem. John chapter 4. On verse 20 to 26. Our ancestors worship on this mountain. But you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me. A time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. Jesus said, "No, say, Oba Jimmy, this say, Debbie Ba, and yet be poor, so and I say Jerusalem, and I'm over sorry, Ejano." So Jesus is not disputing with the woman as to where to worship. In fact, it is one of the bone of contention between the Jews and the Samaritans. Whether the woman was right or Jesus was wrong was not what he actually wanted. Jesus said, woman, believe me, a time is coming. Where worship will neither be situated anywhere, not on this mountain or in Jerusalem. Then listen to a typical Jew and a Samaritan. Verse 22. You Samaritans. Hmm? This is Jesus. Yes, you can say, or some more Samaritans. Most Samaria for the worship what you do not know. Most sorry, the moon. We worship what we do know. Yay, yes, sorry, the you know. For salvation is from the Jews. It's answering quite general every you that form this one. 
He is emphatic. But look at the next verse. Yet. He is saying that that notwithstanding. A time is coming. And has now come. When the true worshippers. Will worship the father. In the spirit. And in truth. For they are the kind of worshippers the Father seeks. He used to say, "Bibi eriba no kure a sorry for no. We best sorry a jano home and in ukremu. Now one was sorry no sano and a jano reshe. Why? I didn't hear. Why? I didn't. Next verse. God is spirit. If we say onyankupong oya home home. So you cannot possibly contain him on a certain mountain or in Jerusalem. God is spirit. That is a misconception. Which has brought difference between the Jews and the Samaritans. And these worshippers must worship in the spirit and truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. This statement that this woman made really cause Jesus to reveal a secret to, to her. I have heard you. I have heard you. You sound very convincing. But you, let's wait for the message. When he comes, everything will be clear. The next verse. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Jesus said, No, say, Mia, me no recasano, me no. Under normal circumstances. Oh, she knew, pa. He wouldn't say, I'm the Messiah. Anka, on time, cancer me, Messiah. Because it will cause so much trouble for him. Son said, Between your how can see a breno? Then the woman looked at his face. <laughs> left her jar there. <laughs> Went to Samaria. <laughs> brought the whole town. <laughs> I have seen the Messiah. <laughs> He's told me everything that I've ever done. <laughs> Maybe she should have asked. And she has convinced me that worship is not situated at a particular place. Next verse. Where is the right place to worship? That was what the woman was expecting the Messiah to come and answer. How do we worship the eternal God? But the one who spoke to her is the Messiah. The eternal God who is to be worshipped. We'll continue next week. When we talk about three requirements of the Old Testament worship. That has been effectively dealt with by Jesus Christ. To the extent that this argument from this woman is unnecessary. I know that we all love to worship. But I want to invite you so we will rethink worship. God is spirit. God is spirit. God is spirit. One day, this elder told his pastor, and when the pastor was complaining about some dubious things he has heard of him, so far as his business was concerned. Then he told the pastor, says, this is work. 
a year juma is his business. A hen so a year we are my juma, my juma was what you are saying is church. Now, oh, canoe, what you are sorry, I said, Nawudi. When we are going to work, so oh, quite juma, do you leave the Holy Spirit at home? So, would you don't conclude, oh, Fiana, have you forgotten that God is spirit? Refus, when you are made, oh, yeah, home. And that the workplace, he is also present there. Now, what you remember? Now, when we rethink worship, say, you are doing, sorry, who you are. Holiness will be easy for us. Like I said, there will be no dichotomy between what we call secular and what we call sacred. Amen. Amen.